Hello there and welcome to my vlog of the second week of December 2021 and no like surprise here there is no Battletech news this week especially in regards like retail and kickstarters which is completely fine and understandable because we're in the run-up to Christmas and I'm sure that uh, Catalyst are getting ready to do their big kind of push to get all the goods out uh, before Christmas. There are still things available on the website, so check that out if you haven't already. Although at this point, or at this juncture, I think if you are buying things this week, not sure if they'll come for Christmas, especially if you're buying in international markets. However, that being said, one of my three orders from Catalyst uh, at the back end of November actually came um, on, I think, Tuesday this week. And it was delivered, like shipped over in like double quick, like speed. I mean, was incredible. I think they, they shipped it on like a Wednesday and I got it like the following Tuesday from America and they were using um, FedEx like special delivery. So that's good to know, um, especially given that like two of my orders haven't been fulfilled yet. They're still kind of like waiting um uh, packaging and, and sending so I would imagine that I will get my stuff before Christmas but I think it will be quite um, like tight in terms of time frames although I don't care if, if I don't get it before Christmas because these toys are for me they're not for anybody else um, but it would be nice if I can get them or just get the delivery in before Christmas because I'm going away for a Christmas I'm going away for Christmas for several days. So when I come back, I can then, um, I'll have my full complete force then that I wanted from wave two. So I can then really start to kind of hit the, uh, the paint table and get it all done and ready. Um, I suppose there is some news from that, from my side, if you've watched previous videos on my like, uh, project managing, managing Battletech forces, I've really extended that quite significantly. I've kind of used the period of time between getting the Kickstarter and then getting like, you know, ad hoc deliveries coming through to me. I, I was using eBay scalpers, shockingly enough, and I've found some like stores now that actually keep things in stock. So I have had things trickling through, but generally I've used this time to really clarify what I want out of my force. And what I've decided is that I was going to get more shelving and get more mechs, which is no surprise really to me because I knew that I'd end up doing that. I didn't want to do it and I've not been stupid with it. So that's actually quite an important thing to say. I'm now going to have a force of in and around 250 mechs and or there or thereabouts and maybe like 70 to 90 units of like support so that's like tanks VTOLs infantry things like that uh, what I'm going to do is I'll give like a breakdown of that project management that I've been able to do um, probably over the next few weeks sometimes so one of my videos will be on that and it's going to be kind of like extended project management because I've started to do like company and battalion building uh, especially for my most well predominantly for my mercenary outfit but also for some of the other forces as well things like what time periods certain mechs are used in used in what kind of variants i'll be using things like that uh, i tend to play battletech quite conservatively in that i don't design my own mechs i can design my own mechs i know how to do that but i just tend to go off the like the standard like variants of, of mechs that you can pick up from places now there are certain variants of mechs that are like really good and there are certain ones that are quite terrible or almost like like suicide mechs like they've got like no armor and they just get lit up as soon as they get touched that can be quite fun to play with mechs like that I quite like it i also tend to play more fluffy and narrative driven but i certainly do that far more than competitive and in the narrative, you'll find that certain mechs have certain design flaws that you can fix if you design your own mech. Uh, just off the top of my head here, I'm thinking about the Enforcer. Uh, the Enforcer has like quite limited ammo for like its regular AC-10 that it uses. I think that's the, the Enforcer D variant. 
And there was, if you read like the source material, it says like, oh, there was a time where they tried to kind of take the small laser out of the head and like give, allocate a little bit more space to ammo. But unfortunately, they couldn't do it because the ammo feed was interrupting with another system. So it would just become problematic. Now, that's obviously like a fluffy narrative thing. That's why the enforcer has limited ammo. I like that though. I like that there is like a narrative reason for it only having X amount of ammo and as well, uh, the enforcer's got nefariously terrible rear armor. So it's like someone has decided to give it the S laser and limited ammo and the shaky rear armor over what you'd be much more sensible doing, which is maybe like dropping a jump jet, um, you know, taking off the S laser, which is pretty useless for an enforcer, given it's got an, an L laser and, a, and an AC-10. I mean, that's you're doing like 18 damage in classic Battletech uh, per turn. If you get two hits with that, it's more than enough. You don't need the S laser. So little little like design chassis quirks like that, I really, really enjoy and like in Battletech. And I try to keep true to that. Obviously, if I am playing competitive, um, I'll usually pick a variant that's that's better. Good example is like the Jenna. Um, there's a variant of the Jenna, uh, like the regular variant of the Jenna, which is like the Karita version. It's very much like a suicide mech, like it's got paper thin armor, but it's very, very well armored for its tonnage. There's a much better variant of the uh, Jenna. I can't remember which version it is. Um, just off the top of my head, I can't remember. Might be the, the regular version might be like the D. Um, and this one might be like the F or something like that, the one that I'm talking about here. It basically strips off the SRM4 and puts on 4M lasers and gives it lots of armor. Uh, that is a real bad boy mech. I mean, if you're playing competitively, that mech can be absolute devastating to the opposition because you can really get that rear arc fire in there because it's very, very quick and it's got good jump jets. And the heat is manageable on it as well because it drops out the SRM4. It just has four regular M lasers. So you can pretty much like, I don't think you can alpha strike cool, but you can, you certainly you can use like three lasers and run and you're, you're absolutely fine with that. And three lasers with a 35 ton mech is a pretty decent weapons loadout. Um, obviously you can, if you need to kind of go full guns blazing and use four M lasers, you'd probably just like limit your jump in and, and start to do a little bit more walking, whatever. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at anyway with the um, the like project management side of things. That Excel is kind of, escalated <laughs> uh, but i will show that i've also um gone back to the table a uh, paint table with all the macs um again i've that's something i've been kind of churning through over november because there were certain things like I, I think i mean there's kind of this adage about like art or whatever painting whatever you want to say that it's never finished until the kind of artist not that i'm an artist but the person that's creating the art says it's finished and I think I did like a very base job on all the mechs that I got just to kind of get them available. But as I'm looking at them, and I, I don't usually do this, but I'm looking at them and I'm, I'm having like new ideas for what to do, whether it's like uh, in terms of what shades and washes I want to get on there to make it a little bit more authentic. This week, for instance, I bought some like camouflage uh, nets that I'm going to like stick on top of certain mechs to kind of shield them, you know, from the, um, like, I don't know, air, air fighters coming from above or whatever. That'll look pretty cool. Like a mech draped in like, um, in camo nets, just appeals. Um, got some like interesting decals and things like that to put on there. So I'm not going to go back and like repaint them. I'm just going to like touch them up. And as I'm getting these like extra force packs in, I think I've got another, I want to say like another 10 force packs to get and then I'll become maybe not even that maybe eight and I'll be complete and I'm going to basically like it, when I've got I'll give you for instance later today I'm going to go and finish the Karita force because the only things I were waiting for for the Karita force were two thugs and two dragons I've now got those all the other uh, mechs in my Karita force have painted up so I'm going to go basically paint the two dragons and the two thugs like up to spec and then while i'm doing that i'll use like that time when i've got that paint out you know like red and black what i'm using for the creator basically i'll go back and i'll i'll put more like energy into the it's eight other mechs eight other creator mechs that i've got so that gives you a company 12 is a, a company 12 mechs is a company in battletech so a full a full company there of creator and they're all going to look pretty cool they've all got like specific 
like design quirks. Like on the Karita, I've started to put things like um, like Eastern religious um, symbolism on there, like the whole um, like yin yang um, icons and stuff like that. There's some pretty interesting stuff that I've managed to to get hold of that I'll be putting on there. So that's my kind of BattleTech news. That's where I am currently at. So given that there is no real community news at the moment, especially like not with Kickstarters and and retail. So let's get on to today's topic, which is something I've wanted to do for a while. Uh, this is a going to be a a, a game, purely gaming um, like video. Uh, last week I did some theory. Um, so let's move back into like tabletop space now. Uh, just a word on last week's video. There was a really weird um, like problem that I've never encountered before, where my voice was out of sync with uh, the video. I think that's because I've been recording uh, the a, a, a playthrough of the Hairbrain Schemes 2018 BattleTech game, and I think I've maybe dislodged the settings on there. Hopefully now this is okay. I think there is still like a tiny microsecond delay on there, but that's fine. I mean, it's just, it's when it's like half a second, it's just really jarring. I mean, I watched it back and was like, what the hell? <laughs> How the hell has that happened? But I don't think that's going to be the case today. Hopefully not, anyway. I'll soon find out when I finish the video and play it back and then I start like pounding the table because I'm like, no, it's happened again. But hopefully it hasn't. So today's topic, what I want to discuss is mods and homebrews in classic Battletech. Because I'm sure it's something we all do. Uh, there are kind of some staples that you need to know about, you know, some, some quirks, some design quirks, whatever you want to call it, before you get into playing classic. Important to say as well before I get into this that there are many different uh, like variants of Battletech. So, well, I say many. There are many homebrews, but there are kind of two official ones. That's Classic and, and Alpha Strike. I don't play Alpha Strike. Um, I've kind of, I've always meant to kind of get into it, but I, I tend much to prefer skirmish games. And Classic really, really gives you a like a skirmish option because realistically, you're not going to bring two companies of um of mechs to the table and have what 24 sheets to manage that would be crazy so alpha strike is when you need to like play the, the big war games and i just i'm not interested in playing big war games i much prefer to have like uh at, at most like two lances versus a star or at very very most like two lances versus two lances and if I'm playing like narratively, I'll just do it within the, the confines of a wider conflict. So you can say, okay, well, this is the, I don't know, the invasion of Luthien or whatever. And this is one part of it. So this is like on the outskirts of a town or something like that. Uh, we have Smoke Jaguar in one corner and we have uh, the Karita in the other. And then they go at it. And you're basically, you're having the battle within the confines of that. Which is kind of how warfare works. Like you, this, like you get like your big charges and stuff like that. But it's warfare is a very, very weird like thing. Like it, it, especially if you would play like with mechs, which is like fantasy warfare, you aren't just going to have like people mowing mechs into one another. It's going to be much more like like an elongated strategy. Like okay, well these this company here are attacking from this angle and these are doing this and then there's these tanks in support or whatever and that's how i like to play battletech and classic really allows you to do that because it allows you it makes you it well you must streamline it otherwise it just becomes chaos saying that though even just playing like lance on lance versus battletech classic can take you a crazy amount of time and that's not something i'm particularly keen on and i think in when battletech was like designed as a as a concept in the very like early days and it was like okay well let's just run like lance versus lance and it will take what two or three hours to play that through to like you know to the end if you're playing like last man standing and that's fine uh, but now obviously this is you know f what like nearly 40 years on and people have just changed massively like we're not as patient we also have got like instant access to everything right so whether that's like knowledge or even in gaming like gaming has dumbed down a lot you know in terms of like video games because people just don't have the kind of like the will to kind of learn the games properly anymore that's not 
everybody. Obviously, I think this a lot of this is because gaming has now become game, uh, mainstream and is very popular. So to kind of popularize it to a, a more general audience, they just make it easier, which is understandable. Not all games are like that. Um, I was playing a game recently called um, Dyson Sphere. Uh, which is an incredibly like interesting quirk. You basically there's no warfare in it. You're basically just a little like robot, and you have to create like um, a Dyson sphere around a star, and you literally start as a robot on a tree on a, a planet with trees and water and rocks, and you just have to kind of build buildings and and you know. Uh, like mine things and then you make all this amazing technology to try and ultimately try to create a Dyson sphere around a star it's a very like addictive game uh really I think it's quite a therapeutic game it's quite a smart game it makes you think makes you plan um I'd certainly if I was like um like teaching and was like you know you, if you even if it's like project management or like how to like for kids for instance like how to um think about things like analytically have a methodology because you've got to kind of plan your little factories and to, for your wider empire and a uh, very very smart game and there's a lot to it there's a lot of like things going on in the background of that game so I, when i say that gaming is dumbed down that's certainly not universal there are certainly games out there that are really really interesting and complex but for tabletop, when you're playing like warfare, like BattleTech, which is basically, you know, the fun of or the joy of piloting or pretending to pilot these massive mechanized like death machines uh, to go to war with each other, I don't necessarily want to spend like three or four hours going through that grind. So what I have kind of done in my own little BattleTech realm is create my own like um, homebrew rules. I'm sure that most people watching this do the same thing. I'm going to go through some of those rules now. Some of them, I think, are very, very standard in Battletech. So most, like, um, you know, like private... I'm not talking about, like, proper competitions. There, they'll probably just you have to use the actual rules as written. But, like, you might find a group of, like, 20 people who play Battletech and they've kind of got their own rules because they don't like X, Y, and Z about it. So they've decided to change it within their little group. And... That's definitely the way to go. I'd advise that you do that. If you've got a few of you playing, um, there are things that you can do to really speed Battletech up and to make the game more enjoyable as well. Like, you know, that, that, there's, there's just no way to put this. The original version of Battletech has got a lot of flaws in it. Um, it and after 30, 40 years where they've kind of fixed some of these kind of, and you there's... Very much an argument suggests that the clan invasion was like a fixing of those rules that were a bit weird and funky. A good example with the clan invasion is um, melee combat. So that it's kind of, this is the genius of Battletech really, it's written into the law that the clans are far too honourable to have like fisticuff robot fighting. So we don't, the clans don't do that. Um, they obviously did that because the uh, physical battle or physical attacks in Battletech are so clunky. I mean, for what is quite a streamlined game, like if you use the Gator system, which is basically shows you what modifiers you need to hit something, so you can work it out easily. Um, when you've got that, which is really streamlined, so you just have to like count the hexes, see the terrain between you, um, target modifiers for how many, like, you know, hexes your opponent's moved what your movement action has been you add all that together you get your modifier easy um when you've got like um when you get into like physical combat it's like well would you like to kick or to punch and then if you punch you have to use this table and oh you've not got a hand, hand actuator well that has to put you a minus one, a plus one for your uh, the punch attack blah, blah. and it, it's you would kind of reading that and being like what like it, in terms of how the streamlined the actual like firing system is the physical attack is very very complex um especially when you get into things like charging and death from above and pushing they're not complex it's just it's just laborious like you have to think about it and be like well if i do that what are the consequences then there's a the very basic math involved so it'll say our oh, damage given is like um you know I don't know, it'll give like a percentage of your chassis weight or something like that. So it's just, it's complex. And the clan invasion was kind of like, well, let's just do away with that because it's really clunky and it's, people aren't going to like that. So you could say that that was a version two on a, in of its own right. But importantly, they didn't retcon physical attacks. If you want to physical attack, it's still there. 
they kind of put a rule in where if the inner sphere like lowers themselves to doing punchy robot attacks, the clans will actually retaliate with punchy attacks as well. Which can be quite dangerous because the clan mechs are generally pretty lethal in, in every respect. So what you don't want is for them to come like very much up to you where they're also firing weapons where they don't have uh, like minimum range penalties usually. Like their LRMs don't have uh, minimum range penalties, which is insane. I still think that is some kind of weird mistake made uh, in the gaming system because it just makes no sense. Um, so you, what you don't want is the clans to really come at you in that sense because then they get the added bonus of doing physical attacks. With things like a timber wolf, 75 tons, that's going to hurt as well if it, if it tries to kick you or anything else. So I've just got a list here of things that I think you can do on, on two fronts. One, to make the game more enjoyable and to fix some of the, the issues uh, that are clearly in there from original Battletech Classic rules. But secondly, how to speed the game up. Um, so let's, I'll just go through this as kind of, if I've got it uh, written down here. So the first thing, and this is, a, this is quite unusual, and I think it's because Battletech is such an early gaming system, they didn't include any system of rerolls, which is... Again, very strange. Like, if you play most gaming systems, they'll have, like, a, a, a re-roll system in there somewhere. I mean, at the moment, I'm kind of obsessed with Blood Bowl. Um, I've just painted up, like, um, 18 teams. I mean, I have been literally living on the paint table now for, like, six weeks. So I've been getting through an incredible amount of stuff. I've got the final team coming next week. I've got the Corn team. That's kind of the last team that I want. Um, I'm not interested in getting any of the old worldy stuff like the high elves and the norse and stuff like that i've basically got season two and everything that's in season two and then i've got dungeon bow and the corn team because they kind of go together a little bit because the corn uh, roster is in dungeon bow and um the one of the things that was inbuilt into into blood bow is a reroll system so you purchase rerolls as like a gold coin cost when you kind of making your team it costs between 50 and 70 thousand gold pieces for like one reroll depending on the team and um that's that's been there since the 90s i mean i had the like if i made before that actually i think blood bowl's an 80s game um i only have blood bowl i think the first version i got of it was second edition so i imagine that was in the early mid 90s whenever that came out and on your little like uh template where you keeping track of turns and you've got your dugout and things like that. Um, there's like a bit for rerolls. So rerolls have been a thing in games for a long, long time. It, obviously, in most games, it's like a special ability. So it's, oh, if you like roll a one, then you can reroll. Or if you uh, choose to do so, if you fail this thing, you can reroll. Doesn't exist in Battletech. So that's something you can do very, very quickly to kind of almost speed up the game because if you're putting rerolls in there you're putting like incre increased chances to hit your opponent or do more damage or whatever else you just have to come up with some rules around that so the first one is quite universal for rerolls you can never reroll a reroll like the second dice roll is always what what is given or the result is is always that you can also like um put other things in there like you could use it as like a, a penalty if you go over battle value. Like So for every X amount of battle value over the given rate that you decided to play with your um, like opponent, then you get one like reroll. Uh, little things like that that you can do to make the game a little bit more interesting. Um, or you can like um, just predefine it and say, well, we each get three rerolls each. That does add a lot of flavor to the game because when you fail that critical thing and you're like, oh no, and then but you reroll it and then you get it and it kind of changes the game um, just through this like little little action. So rerolls is something that are fun and interesting to do and obviously don't cost you anything. Like you don't have to buy reroll tables or reroll terrain or anything like that you just literally say well you have three chances and we'll put that on a scoreboard and when you're three are up then you're out or whatever and you don't get any more rerolls the second thing in um how to speed things up quite a lot in battletech is to have um what i'd call like damage limitations so, for instance, I think a lot of people do play this. If a mech loses both legs, then rather than crawling around on the floor, which you can do, um, as denoted in like classic Battletech rules, you just have it that the pilot eject, um, ejects. 
um, you know, from the from the cockpit and um, goes to safety somewhere. Now, if you're playing a narrative campaign, that can be quite like good to do because you want you might want to keep the pilot alive. So it's like if you lose both legs, that's a good one. Another one you can do is if you lose all weapons, because rather than having like a, a mech running around like a headless chicken, like headbutting people, which is fun in its own right. But rather than doing that, it's like the logical thing to do if you're thinking about like what an actual military professional would do. They'd be like, I can't really do anything anymore. I don't want to die for nothing. So eject and there they go. There are other routes you can get more severe on it if you want. So you can say like, right, if you lose both side torsos, then you eject. You can just basically unbrew whatever rules you want. That does speed the game up quite a bit because um, you'll find that like you'll you're able to like make a casualty of mechs much quicker, so that's nice. That can also be very very uh, good to play if you're playing narrative games with salvage because if you destroy both um, legs, then you're obviously going to get access to all the kind of salvage points that exist, like weapons and actuators, like you know. Not not hip and foot actuators, obviously, but you you know you can have like hand and um, actuators, for instance, or gyros if you if you play in that into that level of detail. Um, so yeah, like that's that to me is actually quite a it's it's something that it really should have been written into the basic rules of BattleTech. I don't know why they decided to have this like oh well the mech's then on the floor and it can shoot with its right arm if it can stabilize with its left it's just like, oh come on really like no nobody would be doing that in a warfield situation they'd be like i've now become completely irrelevant to this battle i'm going bye <laughs> then eject out of the head or whatever so that's a, another quite easy one that you can do um i would also say that to kind of counter this, well, not to counter it, to, to supplement this a little bit, I'd say it's also a very good idea not to play Last Man Standing. Um, that's kind of, if you just go through like a generic uh, Battletech, like, you know, the vanilla campaign, um, the vanilla mission to do out of the box, it will just say play until, you know, the first person's lost all four mechs. That's going to take you a lot of time usually, so I'd stay away from that. Uh, you've got the much better way to run BattleTech is to play like limited turns or objectives, and you can get as creative as you want with that. So just off the top of my head here, you could play, for instance, there's a a a, a battle um, defense and attack. So there's like somebody's defending a position and then somebody's attacking a position. You could do something of like how much the, the turn that the sorry, the team that deals the most damage over a six turn period wins. So you know, like, you, and that you just tie it up. So you at the end of it, you've got your record sheets and you can score it if you want. So you can say for each like lost arm, you get X amount of points and for. You know, like almost like a, a sporting table. Um, or for each like lost weapon component, a, a, a destroyed gyro gets you three points or whatever. You can get as creative as you want uh, and just run it like a sport. I actually play that variant quite a lot. Uh, I especially play it like if I've played narrative games before and done like, um, like gladiatorial games. I have this kind of like idea when this is complete headcanon. But I hate this idea, like on Solaris, which is the kind of, you know, where they play the um, the gladiator games in Battletech. Um, I, they have, it's like, oh, they're all destroying each other and everything else. I'm like, no, it wouldn't be like that. You'd have like sports teams, you know, like each, uh, like a lance or a company or whatever would be playing like their equivalent of whether it's like soccer or American football or basketball or whatever else. And there's kind of a league table. And obviously you wouldn't be doing that if you were just getting your like mechs junked and your mech warriors, your star mech warriors killed. You'd want to put limits on it. So I played like a variant of like a Solaris games where you basically, if you lose 50% of your armor integrity or you lose like a key component, like a gyro, or your engine or something like that, the game will automatically like eject you and then you the pilot is safe, but they've lost the, the mech, so to speak. And stuff like that I really like. And I think that could be developed quite a lot in Battletech to kind of give like a codified competitive codified competitive ruling system. Something I think Bat uh, Catalyst should really look into because it gives like parameters for competitive players. 
I can do it on like a, a very much like an ad hoc amateur level. It really does need somebody who understands like gaming mechanics and math and things like that to come up with like balance and, and everything else. I, I'm not that good at doing stuff like that. So I can kind of see it from an instinctive point of view and say, actually, I think this needs to be fairer. So I'm going to tweak this li a little bit or whatever. But, you know, be creative with it. Do different kind of missions. I mean, the, uh, another kind of famous mission in Battletech is like escorting the um, convoy or something like that. They're always very fun missions to play. So it's like you have like a convoy of like vehicles and tanks. And then you have uh, like maybe you're a lance of mechs protecting them. And then you have another lance of mechs coming to attack them. But rather than playing the whole, well, let's just see who destroys which team first here. Just have it like, okay, the attackers have got six turns to basically block off this road by getting these objectives here. And it's the defender's role to defend these objectives while the tanks and vehicles can sneak away. Um, the best way to do it, in my experience, is just to play run through games. And you'll play it through and you'll find actually it wasn't fair because reason X. So the next time we play it, we're going to kind of put a function in for that and, and try to, you know, nerf or like buff that ability uh, for the other team because the, it was just too easy for the other team given what we set down. The next one, um, this kind of relates to speed um, and that's really trying to limit your paperwork. Now, you can do this through like um, homebrews and mods or like your own mods for the game. I have a very, very strict rule with Battletech. I only ever use the uh, like a record sheet for mechs and tanks. I flatly refuse to use it for anything else. So I won't use it for um, like air support. I won't use it for infantry. I don't use it for buildings because the thought of having to kind of keep track of like uh, like integrity structural integrity armor for i just it i like doing it for mechs it's fun for mechs it is not fun to do it for everything in the t on the table it becomes very very grindy so there are several things i think you can do to really speed that up the first is like i said just say you're only going to keep record sheets for like the bigger units like mechs and tanks the other one that you can do to fix this is to get this. I've got two here. So these are the, uh, try and get that into camera. Uh, oh, shiny light there. There we are, the Battlefield support deck. Um, you can get these from Catalyst. I think they're still available. Uh, or they certainly were uh, when I last checked, uh, which probably a few weeks ago now for these. But I've I got this from, Battle, uh, from Catalyst a few weeks ago. And um, these are super useful because it basically gives you like very quick card access to things like planes, bombers, artillery and mines. So rather than you having to kind of do all the complexities about, you know, oh, I've got this. And obviously, honestly, like Battletech's like fighter plane function is just awful. Like it just, it's just miserable. <laughs> like it, it's, there's things in it like thrust and... Uh, oh, it's it's an it's nightmarish, and I just don't want to have to keep track of it. So, but you have to if you want a realistic kind of gaming system. Air support is a thing. Oh, one thing I should say, I do uh, keep track of VTOLs as well. They are kind of, you know, they're different because they move like say like a, a mech or a tank does. They don't have thrust, so they can basically stop and and turn and and do everything else. Planes in Battletech basically just like fire across the battlefield and then you've got to work out thrust and how far they're going and oh they've gone off the map now and they come back in another turn. It's an absolute nightmare. So these or this little card system you get here is far superior to that because it will just give you like it also in introduces that like a card game to the actual um to the tabletop game as well, which I think is very fun. I've tried this a couple of times now. I've had to homebrew some of the stuff because I don't use hexes. So it will say stuff about mines, like you have to choose a hex or write down a hex. Instead of that, it's like you have to write down a location and then you have to kind of predetermine that, um, not with your opponent, because they won't know where it is. But there are little things you can do. And it, if you're playing on th uh, like three dimensional terrain, you'll need to you know, get a little bit creative with this, but the, the system itself is great. So that really, those two things really speed things up. Uh, unfortunately for me, I really like using infantry. Um, just to, almost like as a narrative thing. Like I love the idea of like little dudes running around, like shooting pop guns and SRM missiles at these massive robots. 
But what I don't want to do, like I said, is to keep record sheets for them because I just don't want to do that. What I do instead, I've got a very unique system for, for infantry. It completely like changes all the rule system for them. Um, I won't go into it now because it's quite complex. But effectively, I keep score of how many hit points they have with dice. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the intricacies of it because that might be for another video. I might do something on how to kind of... Uh, get infantry on the table or lots of infantry without having to keep like a million pieces of paper um, so and I, I like the idea that infantry and battle tech are just a nuisance you know they are not there to kind of they, they can't be there to like really do any like objective capture because they're too slow the exception to that is if you've got like uh, infantry in a VTOL uh, or in a um, like a, a badger which a badger is um, one of the vehicle infantry vehicle thing i can't remember what they're called so mechanized infantry um so you can use it to get them into place and then maybe pick up an objective but i just like to see it as oh they are just a nuisance as opposed to to anything else really and i'm also very good for like defensive positioning so like if you've got like um like walls or buildings you can say okay there are, you can put infantry on the top of that call them dug in gives them a, maybe a little bit of a defensive bonus to you know like being hit things like that um so yeah I, you can get creative with infantry and I, I i think the core rules for battle tech classic do not support infantry well at all i think the original game producers had this like idea that oh everything had to be done on sheets because that's our system and that's what we're using and we're going to put everything on sheets including like building integrity I think that's a really, really bad mistake. I think they should have come up with a, a gaming system in their own right for infantry and buildings and things like that. Much like these, uh, this latest Battlefield support deck here, which gives you like the added inclusion of using more interesting units in Battletech without the grind of having to keep the records of it. The next thing, and this is something that I think, again, most people who play Battletech do this. I do this for two reasons. One, because I find it more enjoyable, and two, because it speeds things up. So this last thing is is basically does two in one of, of what I've been discussing thus far, and that's to really, really buff some of the weapons. So the first two that I'll talk about, because I only do this to three weapons, but the first two are very, very similar, and that's the AC2 and the AC5. So they're the auto cannons. The AC2 is basically a long-range, like, skirmishy type weapon, that does terrible damage. The, um, the, the the damage level of an AC is denoted by its number, so an AC2 does 2 damage and AC5 does 5. That simply doesn't cut it. Um, I think they really made an error with that. It should have been called an AC4, basically. Uh, the AC2 should have been. And it should do 4 points of damage, so that's what I keep it at. The range is, I keep exactly the same, um, but I just up the, the damage level to 4. An AC5, I up that to 7. Uh, AC-10s and AC-20s I keep at 10 and 20 because they're very powerful guns in their own right. But I think doing that to AC-2s and AC-5s really kind of gives them more prominence on the on the battlefield. And for my second point, it speeds the game up. Because if you're playing, for instance, let's say you're playing um, a Davian Lance uh, versus a Pirate Lance or something like that. Well, if you're playing like Fluff Rules, and you've the Davians are probably going to bring things like blackjacks to the to the tabletop. Blackjacks have if you had say say if you had three blackjacks on the table, that's six AC two weapons. And I just feel like AC twos doing four damage is a lot more. First, it's a lot more realistic. These are auto cannons. It is shells that they're firing. It's not like pop shots. It's not machine guns. It's like a proper like artillery shell even though it's a much smaller variant than like an ac20 so i think four is is more appropriate for that i also think that like when it, it doesn't like discriminate against mechs that have like things like um the vulcan which has got an ac2 which gives it if you put give it that extra damage of four it just gives it a little bit more credence you I don't mess around with the battle value on that, so I don't say, oh, well, a, a, an AC2 is now worth a little bit more battle value. I don't do that because it's kind of universal, so like, everyone gets access to that. Uh, it just depends if you want to take that mech or not that's got the AC2 or the AC5s. So it just gives them a little bit more of a bonus. 
And the final weapon that I really, really buff is the machine gun. Now, there are several ways to do that. Um, the first one, this is something I don't do, but this is a really quick win if you want to kind of buff the machine gun. Do D3 damage. What a D3 is basically like you just use a D6 for that. Uh, and a 1 and a 2 becomes 1. A uh, 3 and a 4 becomes 2. And a 5 and a 6 becomes 3. So when you're attacking with machine gun, you roll a dice. If you get 5, you basically get 3 shots of the machine gun that turn. So it kind of makes it into a little bit of an like an SRM almost, but like a not as it's it's obviously not as good as an SRM because it doesn't have as good as range, but it just gives it a little bit more of a punch. Uh, so that I think so that's I think the standard one to do with machine guns. I actually buff it more than that, but I also nerf something in it as well. So let me just go over this. The first thing I do with machine guns is up their range. So the standard range for machine gun is one, two, three. When people give those three figures in Battletech, that's basically denotes short, medium, and long range. So one, two, three, short, medium, long. Uh, that's pathetic, uh, really, really bad. Um, and generally, in classic rules, you'd only use machine guns really for things like infantry. You can use it for mechs as well. Like if you got in the rear arc, it can be quite useful because armor is quite low there. But I do two things with machine guns just to make sure that people use them or to even allow the people to use them. One, I increase the range. So I double the ranges. So one, two, three becomes uh, two, four, six. So still not great range, but okay range. And I up the damage to three as opposed to two. So I don't do two, uh, I don't do D3 damage. It's just one shot, but it does three points of damage. Again, that can help speed the game up because if you have a mech that's got quite a few machine guns on there and it gets into close range, that extra point of damage can be pretty useful. You know, it can start shaving armor off quicker or go the game gets done quicker because mechs get destroyed more quickly. Hey ho. So that's kind of my system for machine guns. There are many others that you can do, but the nerf that I give the machine gun is ammo. Now, the machine gun ammo in Battletech is absolutely ludicrous. Like you get, for a standard like ton of ammo, you get 200 points of ammo. So if you shoot with one machine gun in classic Battletech, you go to 199. How many games of Battletech are going to last 200 turns? Right? It's stupid. I mean, fair enough, you might have two machine guns, so you do two shots. Uh, or you might be doing D3, in which case you might have two machine guns and do five shots. Fine. What I do, I say that each shot of a machine gun takes 10 points of ammo. So that gives you basically 20 shots with one ton. But the bonus is you get the extra range and you get the extra point of damage. And it means people will use them. Because what you'll find, unfortunately, with machine guns in Battletech is that they're so disliked that people will just dump the ammo before the game. So they'll just say, like, you'll, you'll be, they'll just say, oh, I, I'm not, you know, the machine gun ammo, I'm just going to open the hatch and it falls out and I don't have machine guns. And I just think that's really, like, sad because machine guns are quite a fun, like, thing. I mean, you wouldn't do that if you had, like, infantry on the table, you'd probably keep it. But if it was just, like, lance versus lance uh, and you had, like, um, let's, like a, a mech that has the ammo in there so there can be a potential of an ammo explosion, you'd far rather just get rid of the ammo uh, and you know go with what you've with the weapons that you've got but i don't with machine guns when you're saying to people well you can burn through that arm, ammo quite quickly so like if you had say you had like four machine guns on a mech and you've got a, a you know 20 points of ammo on there effectively with my system then you've basically got five turns of shoot with alpha striking with that and that's it you know so you can basically you probably say okay well i'll keep that because that's that's pretty good like you know, damage levels. And if you've got four machine guns, the chances are you're a bit of a tanky mech or meant for, like, close combat or close range combat. So you probably you probably think, yeah, I'll keep that and I will use them. But I will take the risk of the ammo in there. But it could be that after, you know, when you get to, if you're playing multiple turns and you're on, like, turn eight or eight or turn nine, you've used, like, 80% of your machine gun ammo. So it's done its job and it's been used. Great. And that's all I want is for people to be able to use it. And I think the... One of the big gripes in Battletech is that the ranges are, are so stupid, and they are. And there's a very funny, if you read the um, the manuals for Battletech, 
there's a very snarky like paragraph at the start of the manual. It's in the, it's in the new manual as well. If you have the new game of armored combat, you read it. It's one of the first things they put out there, which is very much says something like, "We know that machine guns have generally, in even in our time, have got very very good range, far more than the whole one two three, which is effectively I don't know like." 90 meters or something like that like machine guns fire way farther than that so you have got there but what they're saying to you is this like if you want real ranges if you want us to do the whole uh you know x amount of thousand meters transferred onto you know six millimeter game then you would have to get a tabletop the size of a tennis court i think that is like a direct quote from them or we can just kind of say, well, yeah, range is limited on machine guns. It's just use of like close uh, combat skirmish weapon. Then it's, it's a very funny, snarky comment, which I always smile at when I read. However, I think you can kind of factor this into fluff to some extent. And I would say that like, like if you are, if you're dealing with like a machine gun on a, a walking turret that is a mech, you could probably say that, like, they're going to be pretty scary weapons to use because, like, it's difficult to kind of articulate, but let's say, like, if you were shooting, like, an AC-5 and you can see your target and you've got one shell and that's just how good a shooter you are, right? So, like, that one shell, you've got to kind of get your target and you've got to say, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, the wind direction and speed is telling me this. You know, you might have, like, a little gauge on your mech. So I'm going to shoot here, and then by the time that mech is moving and my shell gets there, it's going to hit, hopefully, the mech. So it's that how good a shot you are, how good your instincts are on the trigger. But with a machine gun, which is basically just like a daka daka cannon, which goes like spray fire, you can't really do that. So accuracy on these at any level, you know, if you're talking hundreds of metres, is going to be absolutely terrible. From like a, a, a machine that is already walking very, very quickly, firing at a machine that is also walking very, very quickly, you can kind of see reasons why the, the machine guns will be absolutely useless in this and would probably be more like hassle than they're worth because you might do a lot of like collateral damage you might you know which is obviously uh, it's crudest it's bad pr like you might miss the mech and destroy the farmhouse or something like that with your machine gun fire so i can i kind of i can get into like a narrative mindset where the machine guns would be a bit of a a funky thing to use but again i just i i will buy that that's like my rationale for it but i will also say but the the machine guns do need to have a little bit of promise need to have a little bit of firepower you know a little bit of damage dealing to them and a little bit of range so that's kind of my like little little buff for them and that that's it really i mean they're the kind of the main homebrew things that i do there are others as well like little idiosyncratic things that i do but i'm not going to go into those now they're kind of the main ones that i've kind of got listed here um so yeah like i i think my wide the point the real reason that i wanted to do this video was just to say that classic is something that gets a bit of a bad rep with being oh you know oh it's, it takes so long it's such a long game yes as written it is a very long game but you can introduce little little quirky things in there to speed the game up immeasurably things like extra damage for certain for certain weapons not keeping um like report cards or damage cards for everything um i think one thing that i've really started to use as well is the flex app um, I think that's how you say it anyway. Um, it's basically like um, a, it's like an app for damage. And I find that you can do that very quickly. If you're playing with someone who knows the game as well, you can basically, like, you roll the dice and then they control the damage on the screen. Uh, I actually bought a um, one of those uh, music, um, music reader holders. I have no idea what they're called. Music stands, is that what they're called? Uh, where you put your music when you're playing your instrument. Uh, I bought one of those, like a pretty sturdy one of those, and put like um, a very like uh, long lasting battery laptop on that. <laughs> and then when I, if you, like, let's say I'm the player rolling for damage, as I'm rolling it, the person across the table then has got the mouse, and I'm literally just shouting out like right torso four, left leg five, and then they're just like putting the, the damage in there. So now you can, that's obviously, it doesn't really save you that much time because you do the same on paper. But 
it also means that you can see it. You, you, it's, I know this is going to sound so sad and geeky, but it's like that, the flex thing, is like what you are seeing in the cockpit of the mech, right? You say on, t- on the um, on paper when that's in front of you, but it's like that's your sensor, and it's like a computerized sensor, and it does cool stuff, does the flex app. So like when you lose a... If you crit like an M laser, it will actually red out the M laser in your weapon fire. So you literally will know straight off the bat, oh, I can't use that anymore. It's readied out. And your opponent can see that. And I like that your opponent can see it because that's their sensor as well. And I've got a very like open book rule with damage. Like I know some people play it like, well, you shouldn't be able to look at it. It's kind of a it's like your chess pieces. I don't think that's right. I think that, like, if you're in a mech, you will have the damage sensor of their mech. So any time your opponent should be able to check, actually, you've got more damage on your right arc, and that's where your big gun is. So I'm going to try and outflank you on that flank so that I can do potentially more damage to that side because that's the thing in Battletech. If you kind of hit from, like, a, a certain arc, you'll have a higher probability of hitting that arc of the mech, which obviously makes sense. So it can be quite tactical. So, you know, someone can say, oh, just let me check your hunchback and see where the damage is. Um, and you can just, and on the flex sheet, which is super easy to use, you can just have all the mechs listed there and you can just kind of go between uh, each sheet as, as and when you want. I've kind of, I, I've got a, f- a few friends now that I've, for want of a better term, trained up to play Battletech very quickly. So we can usually get through like a game in like an hour and a half. That's classic. Uh, And that's usually playing with all those kind of parameters that I've said there. So extra damage, specific objectives, um, flex, uh, these wonderful little cards, which I've only used a couple of times, but and they don't necessarily speed things up. But it just means that rather than you having to kind of say, oh, well, we'll take planes and then we have to learn all the rules. It's like, no, no, you just use the cards. That's fine. So there you you go. And I think that's it today. I think I'm going to finish that here. So um, I'll... We'll have a video next week. I I won't do one the week of Christmas because I'm aware, but there will be one uh, next week. Topic yet to be decided, but you'll see it appear um, sometime next weekend. So I will bid you all a fond farewell and thank you very much for watching.